Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Spiritual Spotlight series. Today, I am joined by Holly Erin Copeland. She is a she is the founder and owner of Heart Mind Alchemy. She's a human potential coach, meditation teacher, Reiki master, and a sound healing practitioner. Holly, thank you so much for coming on Spiritual Spotlight series. I'm so happy you're here. Thanks, Rachel. I'm just delighted to be here. So your journey from a conservation scientist to a certified human potential coach and neuro meditation teacher is truly fascinating. Let's dive into your experiences and insights. So here's our first question. (laughs) So your transformation from a conservation scientist to a certified human potential coach and neuro meditation teacher, like I said, is quite remarkable. Can you maybe share some pivotal moments or realizations that led you to make this profound shift in your career in life? Yeah, sure. Well, you know, it started with me being a person who'd always kind of been really interested in nature. I was that kind of kid playing and, you know, playing out in the backyard underneath the, you know, scrubby brush and stuff. And finding tadpoles in the local park and, and just spent a lot of time outdoors. So I fell in love with nature and, and the earth. And I was the kind of, you know, exuberant eight-year-old who wanted to save the whales and all the things, right. I really just felt very passionately about and, 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 in, and in awe and enthralled with the planet and all the creatures and everything. And that led me down a path of um, becoming, you know, getting, landing my dream job when I was uh, in my mid twenties with the nature conservancy as a, um, yeah, as a scientist and working with them, I was actually a mapping specialist. So I worked with them to map the earth and I spent, so I had this beautiful career doing that. And um, there came a point in my mid forties where I'd been in this career for almost 20 years And I was feeling like this groundhog day kept happening where I kept waking up feeling actually quite um, sad about the state of the earth and feeling like there was never enough. There would Mm -hmm. never be enough time, money, or resources. And though while I'd always felt like I'm just doing my part and that's good enough, like it suddenly didn't feel good enough anymore. It felt like, what's this all for? Because there's just a cascade of environmental problems that keep coming. And I just felt like, uh, a sense of hopelessness and despair about wow. the same, right? And and a lot of people share that sense of of grief, right? I mean, understandably so. There's a lot, you know, uh, for example, I mean, the, you know, factory farms was one of the things that just tormented me thinking about the, you know, millions and millions of animals that die in factory farms every day. And um, that ca- that despair and grief catalyzed kind of sent me into a, not only like, like, well, really, who am I? And what's this all about? And I'd actually been on the spiritual path ever since I was, so let me back up a little bit. So also when I was a teenager, I was into Shirley MacLaine and out on a limb and had my first channeling when I was 14. And so my mom was into metaphysics and crystals. And so I was exposed to that when I was 14. Um, And so I'd been on the spiritual path but the two were kind of separate, moving mm. side by side. Me sort of in a spiritual path, reading about those books, but at the same time, living a life as an as an ecologist trying to save the world. And suddenly that, that kind of um, existential crisis about mm. the planet sent me back over to um, actually a deeper spiritual path. And what does that really mean? And how do I do that? And I'd been one of those people who, while I'd been on a spiritual path, had never really meditated deeply or been able to do it because I Mm. felt like, I don't know if I'm doing it right. And it it just, you know, so I would like say things like, oh, being out in nature is my meditation and that kind of thing. Um, But I really came to feel like I needed to to go within Mm. and make some finally confront this mess of what felt like a mind like spaghetti I'm doing this with my fingers because it felt like a spaghetti in my head yeah Uh, and to reconcile that and that's what I did in um early 2019 I kind of set off to rewire my brain I literally wrote at the top of my journal my rewire my brain project I love that how am I I love that so living from our own inner GPS and finding flow 
So finding flow, calm, and happiness are aspirations many seek. Can you explain what it means to live from your inner compass and how can individuals connect with it to navigate their lives more authentically? Yeah, perfect. So that's a perfect setup for the next part of the story. So yes. as I, yes, so as I dove into meditation and I had some beautiful teachers that worked with me to, to do guided meditations and teach me about that, what they showed me as I studied um, and I studied some Tibetan practices of Dzogchen and Mahamudra more deeply was actually to come into a different relationship with who I am, to understand that I'm not any of the things, but I'm actually, we are, all of us, what, what is aware of everything that's happening. And that that essential presence of our being that's here when everything else is changing. So if we start to shift the perspective and the focus from what from the objects of reality to the subject to what is, what is it knowing, the knowing of being. And one of the teachers I've studied with a lot is Rupert Spira, who's brilliant about this, coming back to the knowing, that that knowing is actually essentially open and clear and free. And that our natural mind, right? Our natural mind is open and free and clear. And so to find flow is to actually to find and know that, that our essential being is open and free and clear as the first step, the ground of being, right? right. right? And, and, and so I'm sure it's a spiritual seeker, you know this well, what I'm describing, but I, you know, having kind of read a lot of books, what I came to realize is actually that scientific mind kept tripping me up because I kept going into the conceptual mind to try to solve the problem, but you can't find the answer there, right? <laughs> You have to get still trips me up today. (laughs) Right. (laughs) You know, but it can be as simple as just like dropping out of the mind and the fog of the mind into the heart space. You know, one of the little practice exercises I do with people is just like come out, you know, let your awareness drop down from the, you know, from behind your eyes into your heart and look at the world through the eyes of your heart. You know, it's a completely different experience. But what you just ex- shared is so profound. Like, and I don't think a lot of people realize how profound it is to, to be in your heart and to view the world from the lens of your heart. Mm-hmm. I, I just, even that's, it's a, it sounds like a simple practice, but it's so transformational for so many people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I completely agree. And, you know, and, and those of us who are scientists, and I think one of the thing is that the Western world and the Western education system completely trains us to believe that the the gathering of of knowledge, Mm. knowing, you know, how many facts we can collect in our heads and how many things we can quote unquote know is some measure of success. And what I learned is that it means nothing. It actually has nothing to do with your well-being and happiness. You can gather all the facts in the world and it, it has no bearing on whether you will be happy. So, so true. Uh, so, so true. Why do we keep gathering facts, right? <laughs> I like, like Google, okay. <laughs> yeah. So it's like we have to actually, like, like for me, what happened was I realized, like, I had this the, is a, co- a collection of insights, and one of them was like, there's, you know, this is why the Buddhists say emptiness is form and form is emptiness. Mm. There. You know, the natural mind is empty. There is no solution in, in the gathering of facts. They're just thoughts. They're just ideas. It's so true. It's yeah. so true. So your work combines ancient wisdom with mm-hmm. modern science. What do you find most exciting about merging these two worlds? And how does it contribute to what you call luminous awareness? Mm, great question. So, um, I really like that luminous awareness. Yeah, that's um, Adelaide. Mm. The, uh, Buddhists use it. There's a number of B- Buddhist teachers and another teacher whose last name I'm not thinking of uh, who use it. I-, I love it too, because it really conjures up this idea that actually this awake, alive awareness that we are is luminous. It's filled yeah. with light, right? What we are, are we're light beings, right? Um, I love to merge, to get back to your question. So. 
um, in all in the work that I've done, one thing I've discovered is that you know this these ancient practices, the ain't they're really ancient sciences. Like Buddhism is the science of the mind. That's right. what it is, right? And there's so much deep wisdom there to be, you know, to be um understood and studied, you know. Um, and then I have found I'm a geek and a tech nerd at heart. And I have found that like, like I discovered the, the Muse headband, which monitors your brain waves while you meditate and which is freaking mind blowing. And so, you know, I, one of the first things that I, the story I'll tell now that I did on my journey to rewire my brain was understand brain waves. So understand, mm -hmm. okay, there's alpha, which is this open awareness state. You know, there's theta, the dream state. There's beta, that thinking brainwave state. And one of the ahas I had was like, oh, I'm constantly in beta. I'm constantly thinking. I don't know how to get out of beta. But yeah. once I knew and understood that I could get out of beta and somebody showed me how, um, and the muse headband guides you out of beta into alpha, then it it was it felt like meditation was less of a black box, uh, mm. you know, because before then it felt like, well, how do I even know if I'm doing it right? I don't even know what that feels like, you know. And so I think that modern tools, you know, that's mm -hmm. one example. Um, some others that I love, like I love um, the Huso, which is a um, which is a, uh, you put on a headset and some wristbands mm -hmm. and it plays vibrations that are super healing. You know, um, another one I love is the Apollo, which is a wristband developed by a PTSD um, scientist at University of Pennsylvania and you wear it and it's like those vibrations, we're vibrational beings. Right. And so it reminds your body like how to be at rest. And, you know, one of my clients just like raves about this device who was in a lot of anxiety. So I think there's a lot of ways that modern science can assist us to, you, you know, back into the ancient truths of vibration and frequency is, you know, the essential of all that's, you know, in form in the world. Absolutely. It, it's so true. And I also feel having a science background helps to, you know, explain to your clients kind of what is the scientific backing of what is that I'm looking for you to achieve. Like yeah. I, I, I appreciate being a nurse in that aspect that I can kind of blend it in. Mm -hmm. So it, it is very interesting. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And what it means to, you know, like scientific research isn't everything. And there's Correct. a lot of ways that scientific research is um is constricted you know yeah. and you know for example like i work as a biofield tuning practitioner um so i bring tuning forks into people's fields and support their bodies to heal um the there's new research on the biofield the auric field and i find you know and so they're doing research well how do these tuning forks actually affect you know the field yeah. and so i mean i think as people get the data behind it, it feels, you know, it gives it a, a level of credibility. It does. That, you know, is very comforting to a lot of people. And it, and, you know, and because we also like want to be doing the things that have some validation behind them and some repl replicability behind them. Right. It, it's, it's very true because we don't want to just say like, okay, this crystal works. Well, why? Well, because like, that's some, no, <laughs> us yeah. we're not gonna no that's not gonna work with us <laughs> I know. Uh, yeah so let me ask you this because i know that you do meditation so meditation and turning inward are often seen as essential practices for well-being can you maybe elaborate on why these practices are critical to happiness and how they can lead to an awakened mind yeah that's such a beautiful deep deep question um so one, I don't want to make it too complicated because I love simplicity. So let's just go with a simple. In our day-to-day -day experience of being a human, as we move around the world, um, our focus is generally on everything that's, you know, on all of our sense organs, right? On the sight, on what we hear, right? What we feel. And so we, in a way, we're always turned outwards, mm to all of these things. And we're reacting to 
things as they come towards us. So we're in this space of like, see, react, feel, react, hear, react. And what meditation does is create space where we're not, where we're, where we can, you know, close our eyes ideally and start to just tune in to what's my felt experience right now. And can I be with it without responding or reacting? Can I actually cultivate just more of a, of a first of a, of, I'm not just going to constantly respond. And then can I actually feel, and here's the most important part for me. Can I see that there's this relationship going on of subject me experiencing the world? And can I now focus more on the subject, on this presence, this essence that I am and start to see the nature of it relative to everything else? I am not coming and going. So the reason that we like say I'm not my thoughts is because thoughts come and they go. Have you ever had the same thought twice? Right. Right. Like, like, no, like not. I mean, we may have replicative thoughts, but the same, it's a new thought each time, right? It's a new experience. And so it's starting to understand it's, it's basically a vehicle to understand who you really are. Because I think that most of us think if I ask you, you know, who are you? I think most people think they're a collection of thoughts and feelings, Mm. which I did ask my family that once years ago, you know, and I kind of got that stunned silence. Well, what do you mean? Who am I? You know, but like how, how incredible is it that we haven't taken time or why is it that the most important question that a person can ask themselves isn't something we actually ever talk about? in conventional life. Like we're talking about how great this meal is or what right. you're doing in school or whatever, but like, right. who are we really? Like, I'm fascinated by the fact that people don't sit and talk about that. <laughs> Cause that's to me the most important. Most it's very true. Like, I mean, I, I'm thinking about my own family. Like we, I'm probably the only person that meditates and is spiritual and n- nothing against anyone else. And they pray, which I also feel is, you know, a very, a spiritual experience as well, but they don't talk about who am I as a being, right. you know, that's, right. it's more like, how am I externally, exactly. you know, I'm a mom, I'm this, you no, know, I'm, I'm a divine being from the spark of consciousness. Exactly. Like, yeah. Yeah. Yes. That. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but right. yeah, that's a good point. Cause I, this is probably the first time it's come up in 11 months, like this question, like what you just said, like, that's so true. I'm going to ask this more. (laughs) It's just, I just find that fascinating. Like it's so true. There couldn't be a more important thing for a human being to know about themselves. Absolutely. So meditation is the tried and true ancient practice to understand at a personal, not a conceptual level. And this is a really important distinction. It's not to have a conversation conceptually. I mean, I love what you said about I'm a divine spark being and that I essentially think that that's true, but it isn't actually the idea that is what we are. We're that which is knowing the all. So we can't even, uh, I think Rupert Spira said, the truest answer to what you are is silence. I like that. You know, that's very deep. Right. So, um, we are not concepts. We are, you know, I am. And, um, and so, um, there is really no other way to, or the, the, yeah, the tried and true way to know that is to go within and to meditate. Although I honestly think, you know, it doesn't have to be a long 30 minute hour long meditation. Like we can do it right now in this conversation to just pause, feel what's here that doesn't come and go, feel what's here when we don't reference past and we don't reference the future, we just feel 
what's here now. You know? No, it's beautiful. It just makes me feel like I'm within my body and within my heart and just that, that energy feeling for me. I love it. Totally right. It brings us right back. Like, into, yeah. Like, oh, oh. And your whole body, like, like, I don't know about you, but like my body kind it's of, like, wakes huh. up. exactly. Yeah. And it's like, huh, but I'm alert. So mm-hmm. it, it's interesting. And I love I will have to say that this interview, even the energy of it is very calming and Mm. it's just very, it feels very present. Like it's very interesting. It's a very interesting energy field that is coming in. I love it. Yeah. When we together drop into the space of true presence of what we are, not as a conversation, not as a, uh, a, a thing we described, but we actually access it together, then it shifts the energy entirely. But to your point, it's like, it's a, it's palpable, right? It's felt. The listeners will feel this yes, <laughs> because it's, it's real. Yeah. Absolutely. So let me ask you this. So your offerings include workshops, talks, and retreats covering various topics. Could you mm-hmm. maybe tell us more about these events and some of the impact they've had on some of your clients? Yeah. Thank you. So most of the work I've done so far, um, I do, I do, I'm in the San Francisco Bay area and I lead breath work, um, deep transformational breath work, um, in the Bay area. So you can look me up, um, you know, if you're in the Bay area of California, but otherwise most of the work that I do is online and, um, yeah. And I do, I guide master classes, um, that combines breath work. So this deep transformational breath work, sound healing, tuning forks, and then, um, meditative guidance, like we've been kind of pointing to, and I've done a tiny taste of today. Yeah. And, um, wow, it would be the transformations. It's hard to put into words. I mean, people, uh, there's so many people shift. I mean, they really, you know, people who have been, um, carried a lot of pain, uh, a lot of clients that I work with are people who've carried a lot of trauma and pain um, for their whole lives and through these practices and this work together. And it's like, I will help people release that, um, those patterns vibrationally, energetically. Um, and you know, the result is they're so much happier and more joyful, more free, you know, it's, yeah, it's uh, like, it's amazing. And, you know, the reason that I, that I shifted from being a scientist to, to the work that I do now is because I came to see that the greatest gift I could give the world and to help the environment I cared so much about was it's not actually, it's the people, it's not really the environment, you know, it's the people that need to shift and they need help. People need help to come into this knowing, to find their true nature. Um, That's what will save the world you know, in that sense. So I reoriented that it wasn't about protecting nature, but it was about helping people um, help, you know, nature. Yeah. I just find that so beautiful. So for our last question, in your journey of transformation and self-discovery, do you maybe have one piece of advice that you can offer to our listeners that may be just starting on this journey of self-discovery? Yeah. Um. Yeah, what I feel guided to say is that to know that the pain that you feel for the world is the pointer into your freedom. You have to, you know, it's it's the signpost, it's the billboard saying, come here, go within, feel you know, because if we can, you know, in the techniques I do and many other teachers working in somatic inquiry and different techniques, if you can go in and let yourself feel and go into whatever feels uncomfortable to learn to be with the discomfort, 
that's where the goodness, that's where the love, that's where the freedom and all that you seek is actually right where whatever causes you the greatest pain. That is beautiful. I want to thank you so much for coming on the Spiritual Spotlight series. This has been an amazing discussion and I appreciate you opening up to us. No, you're so welcome, Rachel. I'm absolutely um, grateful for the invitation to be here and be with your listeners. And yeah, thank you so much for all the work that you do in the world. I greatly appreciate it. You're so nice.